Hey everyone, Forrest here with Rocky Mountain School of Photography and today we're gonna to take a look at this. This is the Ugreen NASSYNC DXP4800 Plus, a little four bay NAS from Ugreen. And today we're gonna to do a setup guide on how to get this thing going. Let's dive in. I do have one important disclaimer and that is that this is a sponsored video. We're not doing a review today, we're doing a setup guide because I don't do sponsored reviews. But before we get into the setup guide, I do wanna highlight a few really cool features about this NAS. It features a 12th generation five core in Intel CPU, it supports up to eight gigabytes of RAM and up to 96 terabytes of storage space. Additionally, it has a built-in SD card reader and has some cool AI tools that you can use for analyzing your photos. Finally, there are some really cool discounts depending on how soon you're watching this video, either 40%, 35%, or if this is in a long time, maybe 0%, but I've left links in the description to check it out. So what I have here are four Western Digital four terabyte hard drives. Now, I get a lot of questions on this and you can learn more by watching my uh, Introduction to Advanced Photo Storage series. Um, but I really recommend filling your NAS or DAS with hard drives right from the get-go. Um, it is possible to say you, got, you buy a six bay NAS to put four hard drives in to start with and then add two more later. The problem is when you do that, the NAS has to do what's called rebuilding the RAID array, which is basically where it kind of transfers data between drives. And that can take a number of days. And it's also pretty hard on the drives during that process. So I really like to, if you're gonna you know, get yourself a NAS or invest in a DAS, just invest in the total storage to fill the whole thing. Now I'm looking at four four terabyte drives and I know I have a four bay NAS. So that's 16 terabytes of total storage capacity. The problem is I'm gonna configure this using RAID. Now RAID decides how much of that 16 terabytes of storage is dedicated to redundancy, meaning if something was to fail, whether you're safe, um, as well as speed. Some RAID arrangements are a little bit faster than others. I'm gonna be configuring this NAS with RAID 5. RAID 5 means that essentially we will have 12 terabytes of usable space and we will get one disk failure for free. Essentially one of these four drives can fail and we will still have our information safe. Now that doesn't mean that we're backed up. Backups are a separate drive, something in the cloud or another hard drive living at another house or something like that. So we wouldn't call this a backup. We would call it a redundancy that it can handle a single disk failure. You could also go with RAID 6. RAID 6 would provide you two disk failures. However, you're gonna go down to eight terabytes of useful capacity of usable capacity with a 16 terabyte total setup. So you can configure this however you want. I will point out, I'm leaving a link in the description to the RAID calculator um, that will kind of show you how much RAID arrangement will give you how much storage and how all of that works. I know a lot of people get confused thinking, well, wait a second, RAID 5, you get one disk failure, but you get 12 usable terabytes of space with 16 terabytes of total space. How does that work? Um, it, it uses summations and a bunch of really cool math, but I promise it works. RAID 5, if you have a drive fail, you still have your data um, and you still get three quarters in the four drive arrangement, three quarters of your total storage space usable. Again, I don't wanna belabor this too long because I've covered this all in other videos, so check those out again, links down in the description. If you are looking for my recommended drives, these WD Red drives are actually phenomenal. Um, however, uh, lots of different drive manufacturers make NAS rated drives. Just be sure that you're using something that is rated for 24 seven operation because that's what a NAS is gonna involve. Um, WD Reds are, uh, they're great. They're made for 24 seven, uh, NAS drives, that's their purpose, um, as are Seagate Iron Wolf or Seagate Iron Wolf Pro drives uh, or Seagate Exos drives. Those are also kind of rated for the, the intensity of a NAS-based environment. What I wanna do today is get this thing going. So what I'm gonna do is get all these drives unbagged and then I'm gonna stick them into the drive caddies inside of the NAS and slide them into the NAS. Note, I haven't powered on anything right now. This is all initial setup process. It's shucking time. Let's shuck some drives. One thing I will point out on these drive caddies is that they're actually entirely toolless. Um, all one needs to do is pinch this little clip here and pull this apart. And that slides the, the opening large enough to put a drive into the caddy and then you close it when you're done. And that holds the drive in place. Uh, without any screws, which is pretty nice. Um, a lot of drive manufacturers have started to come up with really cool toolless uh, designs. And it's nice to see Ugreen come into that, that uh, same thing. One other little word of wisdom I might plug in here as I'm uh, shucking and installing these drives. 
um, is drives can be dead on arrival. So um, do be kind of cognizant of that. Uh, if you go to set up your NAS and it only sees three out of the four drives, um, you can have dead on arrival drives. And that can be from shipping damage. Uh, that's the most common reason that I see it, um, but anything can cause it. So I've got these drives in here. You guys can see here, uh, we've got one, two, three, four. Um, also, there is a little key that it comes with that we can lock these little drive caddies. However, if they were to pop up, you'd actually have to pull the drive out. So I'm not gonna worry about locking them. Um, but now that the drives are in, let's talk a little bit about how we're gonna connect this to our computer and get it configured. All right, let's go ahead and look at how we connect all of this stuff. It's actually super simple. So the main element that I wanna first talk a little bit about is this right here. This is what we would call a Wi-Fi router and it's really the kind of core backbone of most people's home networks. Now, when most people think of home network, they think of Wi-Fi. And when you think of Wi-Fi, you think of internet, right? Accessing things out there in the world. Well, your home network is actually all of the devices in your house that all need to talk to one another in some instances, but also to the outside world. And that's what this is here for, to basically control all of that traffic and help route things from one place to another. The easiest way to configure our NAS and build it into our home network is simply to take the NAS, and let me tape it down here so we don't have it sliding around. Take our NAS, set it somewhere in your house, and on the back of your Wi-Fi router, you actually, most people will have a number of free ethernet ports. Usually there's gonna be one port that has a different color than the other ports. And the, the different colored port is usually where the internet comes into your router. Those other ports are to connect different devices on your network. So a lot of people maybe have their TV plugged into the back of their router or a gaming console or something like that. But all we need to do is take one of the ports, it doesn't matter which one, out the back of your wireless router and finally connect it into the NAS. And that's what those ethernet ports on the back of the NAS are for. Now, once this is done, you now have been basically bonded your NAS in with your home network. It's that easy, one cord. And the nice thing about ethernet is there's very few requirements on how long distance you can run these cords. So some people may wanna just put their NAS right next to their Wi-Fi router, run a little two foot ethernet cable. It comes with one, you can pop it right in there. Some people might wanna put the NAS in the other room and you can just run a cable to it. Do note that NASes do make a little bit of noise when they're operating. You know, if you've ever used an external hard drive, it sounds like four of those working all at the same time. So it can have a little bit of like a kind of a juddering uh, noise that runs, but it's definitely not super annoying. You probably just don't want your NAS right next to your bed. Now, how do we access this? Well, if you have your laptop, it's super simple. If your laptop is accessing the internet using Wi-Fi, well, it has a Wi-Fi signal that it connects to the wireless router, which is broadcasting a Wi-Fi signal, and the computer is able to access the NAS that way. This would be the most convenient way of accessing a NAS. It doesn't require you plug anything into your computer. So yes, right now I'm telling you that you can plug a 16 terabyte NAS or connect to a 16 terabyte NAS without plugging anything into your machine. Now, the problem is you run into speed loss, right? If you have a wall between you and your router, your speed's gonna be a little bit slower. Uh, if you have a less expensive router, your speed's gonna be a little bit slower. In general, Wi-Fi is slower than a wired connection, but you can do it. So at home, if I need to access my NAS and I'm sitting on my couch, I don't need to plug anything into my computer and I can access the NAS. It's amazing. I don't wanna do a lot of image transfer or video editing in that situation, but it works great. I'm gonna write this down as option number one for connectivity, which would be wireless. Now moving up in speed, let's talk a little bit about option two. I mentioned that there's four ports on the back of your router. Well, if you have two free ports, one can go into the NAS. Well, we also can plug one into our computer. So just like this, we could plug into port two and we could connect via a wired connection. Um, now you might be saying your laptop might not have a wired ethernet port or a wired ethernet cable, that's okay. You can get a USB to ethernet adapter or USB-C to ethernet adapter. I'll have Josiah, our video editor, pop one on the screen right now. But that would be a way to connect your computer to your NAS wired. 
Now, what's this gonna do? Well, this is gonna give you more speed and more reliability. So these wires, like I said, can be as long as you want. So if you have a home that's really big, well, you could just run a couple hundred feet of ethernet from where your router is to where your office is. And you could put your NAS in your office and your computer in your office and then route those back into the wireless router. Just note that the router is the hub of your home network. It's where everything plugs into. So I'm gonna go ahead and call this option number two which would be wired, but this is a one gigabit connection and gigabit is a measure of speed. Gigabit in the world of networking is kind of average these days. It used to be fast, it's average in today's day and age, and it's fine for most things. If you're just gonna use this for photo storage or editing Lightroom or doing things like that, Oh, a gigabit connection is gonna be sufficient. It's gonna be about as fast as a traditional plug-in spinning hard drive. However, if you're used to SSD level speeds, solid state drive speeds, you're probably gonna to wanna to go with option number three, which is wired. However, we're gonna use 10 gigabit. And one of the big advantages of the Ugreen NAS series is that they have 10 gigabit built in. So you don't need to buy anything in order to let it happen on the NAS side of things. The problem is most people's wireless routers are not 10 gigabit compatible and neither are their computers. So we almost need to get our computer upgraded to 10 gigabit speed and our router upgraded to 10 gigabit speed in order to allow that to happen. But there's a very cheap, simple way to do that. And let's take a look at that now. Now we are gonna need one piece of equipment to allow all of this to work and I've left a link down in the description. Now what is 10 gigabit? Well, 10 gigabit is 10 times faster than gigabit. So I would say for those people who are high volume image shooters or you shoot video and you're hoping to edit directly off of your NAS, you're probably gonna to wanna to make the upgrade to 10 gigabit. In order to do this, you really need two main things. We need a way to get our laptop to connect to 10 gigabit networking, uh, or maybe you have a computer that already has 10 gigabit interface. So if you have like a Mac Studio, the new Mac Studio has a 10 gigabit port right on the back of it. If you're a laptop user, I've left a link down in the description for a little adapter you can buy that will give you 10 gigabit capabilities. And then we also need this, which is a 10 gigabit capable switch, a network switch. Now I know I'm getting into a lot of stuff, but really all we've purchased here to make this work is a switch uh, and an adapter for our computer if you need one. Now the connection here is a little bit different. In this instance, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, an ethernet line out of the NAS and connect it into our 10 gigabit switch. So that forms a very fast 10 gigabit connection between the NAS and the switch. And the way to think of a switch is like a hub, okay? It's a thing that can uh, spread traffic amongst lots of different connections. Think of it like a big USB hub. You can plug multiple things into it. Now your laptop or your computer is also going to plug into the 10 gigabit switch. So immediately that forms a 10 gigabit bond between the laptop and the NAS. Awesome. Now I wanna point something out. If you don't have a way to plug your laptop in via 10 gigabit, you have to get a little adapter. So I'll put that here. And again, I'll put a link in the description, but this would be a USB to 10 gigabit adapter. And that would run in line between the switch and the computer to enable that compatible fast speed on the computer. Now, finally, we're not done because we need to take this kind of floating network and connect it back into our router. So there would be one third cable that runs out of the router and into the 10 gigabit switch. Now, this is only gonna be a one gigabit connection because our router is not 10 gigabit compatible. If you have a 10 gigabit compatible router, you probably, again, can skip this section of the video um, and do your own thing because you know what I'm talking about, but a gigabit connection back to the router. So all we're doing is we're adding this faster switch in here to handle all of the faster 10 gigabit traffic and give us the ability to access the NAS faster. So like I said, the NAS can be accessed multiple ways. Wireless is the simplest and the easiest and requires you to buy nothing else. All you do is get home, take the NAS, open it up, plug it into your router, and you're good. Option two is wired, where you are gonna plug into the router and the NAS is gonna plug into the router and you can connect via wired connection. That's gonna be faster and more reliable than wireless. And then finally, if you are a video shooter or a high volume photo shooter, I would spend the extra two, $300 to get 10 gigabit 
capabilities with the NAS. Do note that you can switch between these connection types anytime you want to. So at home, I have a NAS that's 10 gigabit compatible, and if I'm editing video, I will connect that way. But sometimes I don't wanna worry about it, so I just connect with Wi-Fi, and I can connect to the same NAS the same way, regardless of how I'm connected to my network. So it's a very clean, easy interface that allows you a lot of options. All right, now that we know how this all connects, I'm gonna go ahead and take this NAS and connect it to my home network. And I'm gonna kind of catch you guys on the other side once all of this connecting is done. And once this connecting is done, I'm gonna turn on the NAS and we're gonna walk through the initial setup process, choosing the RAID type, running through the software of how to get this thing up and running. Hey everybody, little view behind the camera here. So what I've got going on here is my laptop with a USB-C to ethernet adapter. That's plugged into this ethernet cable, just a standard network cable. The NAS comes with a couple of these. Again, you don't need this adapter if you have an ethernet port in the side of your computer. This ethernet cord then runs back to my uh, router, the Wi-Fi router, and then out of the router, there's another ethernet cable that's coming up and running into the back of the NAS. So here it is. So ethernet from the NAS to the router and ethernet from the laptop to the router. And that's the wired connection strategy. Um, also, I'm plugged into the 10 gigabit port. This is not a 10 gigabit rated whole system yet, um, but the ports are backwards compatible with standard gigabit as well. So that's all done. I've turned on the NAS, so that's running, and we are ready to enter the setup utility and start setting up the NAS. Now that we have the drives installed and everything connected to our computer and our home network, let's look at the initialization and setup of the Ugreen NAS. The first thing we need to do is configure the NAS and get it working properly. In order to do this, open up any web browser on your computer and type in find.ugnas.com. What this is gonna do is search your local network for the NAS. Now, if this doesn't yield any results, it might mean that your NAS isn't plugged into the network properly or something's not connected. So double check the wiring diagram we talked about in the previous section of the video and ensure that the NAS is on and running. What should happen as soon as you go to find.ugnas.com is you should see the screen just like this where we can see the name of the NAS as well as the IP address, serial number, and MAC address. Once we're on this screen, we're gonna go ahead and click connect and this is gonna start the initialization process. Now, I do recommend bookmarking find.ugnas.com in case sometime in the future you can't connect to your NAS and you're trying to find out how to find and rebuild that connection. I've had a couple people in the past that I've set up NASs for move between houses and they've had an issue with configuring their NAS at their new house. And usually that's because networking equipment configuration changes between homes and the NAS doesn't have the same address that it used to and find.ugnas.com can find it for you even if you move or change network configurations. Once we're there and once we get into that setup screen, we're gonna be asked to to give the device a name. Now, I recommend using all caps for this. You're not allowed to use any spaces, but I also recommend going all caps. And I'm just gonna call this Forest NAS, call it whatever you want to, obviously, for yourself. Where it says administrator account, I recommend giving this a good username, maybe a common username that you use on something else. I'm gonna go with Forest C. And then the password, you're gonna wanna choose a nice password. Now, here's a quick note. The only way someone's gonna be able to see this NAS without us turning on remote access, which we will talk about in a future video, is if they are already part of your home network via a plug or via a wireless connection. So I usually recommend to most people to have a very secure Wi-Fi network password, make yourself a nice, long, good password for your Wi-Fi network, and then the devices on your network can have less thorough or good passwords. I like my NAS password to be fairly simple, fairly quick to type, because I'm gonna be accessing it pretty frequently on a lot of different devices. My Wi Wi-Fi password, however, is very locked down, very secure, and I don't give it out to everybody. So that's something to kind of think about. Anyone on your local area network is gonna have access to the NAS if they know the NAS password. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose a password here for my NAS, and then I'm going to confirm and we're gonna go ahead and click next. This next thing is asking us to sync the NAS with a Ugreen account. I'm gonna go ahead and skip this for now. This then asks us how we wanna handle updates. I'm gonna tell this to actually automatically install all updates for the operating system as well as the apps. And I'm also going to make sure that I turn off the share data analysis. I wanna, don't wanna share extra information that I don't need to. And I'm gonna click start. 
And this is gonna bring us in, and at this point, the device has been initialized. It's set up and we can start to use it. So I know I talked about this in my advanced photo storage series, but a NAS is essentially a computer. It's a standalone machine that you can use to run background tasks and all kinds of things. That's one of the best parts about a NAS. What we're seeing right here is the desktop background and the apps that are on the NAS, that we can run on the NAS. So there's backup utilities, some NASs have security camera functionality, there's all kinds of cool things you can do with a NAS. For today, my goal is just to get this up and running as quickly as possible as a good photo and video storage location. So we're not gonna be going into many of these advanced features. We're gonna kinda of go from zero to 100 as quickly as possible. But if you guys do wanna learn more, let me know down in the comment section what specific tasks you'd like me to dive into a little bit deeper when it comes to operating a NAS. One other thing that I would like you guys to do is start a little note somewhere. It could be on your computer, it could be on your phone, wherever you want, of important things you need to write down and remember for your NAS. And so far we have three of them. I really think you should remember find.ugnas.com through a bookmark or write that down in a note somewhere. And then I also want you all to write down your NAS username and NAS password. Without those, we're gonna lose access to the NAS. So it's really important to keep notes. So as of right now, find.ugnas.com and your NAS username and password have those safely recorded somewhere. An additional thing I would recommend writing down would be the actual name of your NAS. So in that first setup where I called mine Forest's NAS, that would be a good thing to write down as well. There are a lot of reminders of those things elsewhere throughout, but again, just in keeping good notes, those are the things we wanna have quick access to in the future. Okay, now that we're in, the first thing I recommend you all do is go to your control panel and go to update and restore and be sure that you don't have any system software updates. If you do, I recommend clicking the install now button and downloading and installing those updates to your NAS. This will take five, 10 minutes. Do note that the fans on the NAS will run at a higher speed. You might hear the NAS whirring away. You might feel the heat coming out of it. That's normal, it's supposed to do that. But get yourself on the latest software version. I also wanna say that I'm running 1.00.0362, which will not probably be the current version when the NAS is out there in the world. So do note that, uh, that we may have differences in where some things are, but most of the stuff we're going over is pretty generic. Step number two of the setup is gonna be going into the storage manager and setting up what's called a storage space. A storage space lives on a storage pool. There's storage pools and storage spaces. You don't really have to worry too much about it. Just know that a storage space is where we can put our stuff. And by default, you're not gonna have one on the NAS. So inside of storage manager, you're probably gonna get this create wizard as soon as you open it. We're gonna click the start button and we're gonna pick uh, what some options are that we wanna use. The first question is for our storage on our NAS is what type of RAID we want to use. I'm gonna go with RAID 5 for this situation and then it's gonna ask me to pick my hard drive. So I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna select all four of my hard drives. I recommend selecting all six or eight if you have a larger version of the Ugreen NAS. And then I'm actually gonna turn on the hard disk test this is gonna basically check each of my four drives and make sure that there's no issues with the hard drives. It will take a few days in some cases, it's gonna take a long time, but it's an important thing. I don't wanna be putting data on drives that are bad from the manufacturer as we're just kind of setting ourselves up for failure. All right, quick warning. When I click next, it is going to ask me a very important question that says, for one, it might tell you that your drives are not on the compatibility list. Um, if you have NAS drives, like, like I said, Western Digital Reds or Seagate Exos drives, you don't have to worry about this. I'm gonna click continue. The big thing is in the next step after this. Um, I just wanna say though, before we even get to that, big important warning. <laughs> this will delete all data on your hard drives. So if you have some old hard drives that you maybe have kicking around from a few years ago, do not put them into the NAS and run through this storage space creator wizard thinking that you're gonna be able to keep the data that's on those drives. It will erase it. And it's gonna tell us that in a second, but I wanna double, double, double check that you guys all know that. Now, in this setting, we ask it asks us how much we want to allocate to this storage space. Now, using multiple storage spaces is a more advanced NAS feature. I don't think we need to worry about that in this video. So I'm gonna set my allocatable space to the total capacity of the NAS, which is what it should default to here. Um, it looks like my total is 11 
terabytes and some change, and I'm allocating 11 terabytes and some change. File system, we want BTRFS. I'm gonna go ahead and click next step. And then it's gonna give you a little kind of summary of what it's gonna do. And finally, I'm gonna click complete. This is where that warning comes in. We are deleting all data on the drives. There's no way around this. If you're gonna set up a NAS with new drives using RAID, it requires a format or an erase at the first step. So I'm gonna click delete all data. It's gonna ask us to type our NAS password. Again, you have that written down, good deal. And we're gonna confirm. We can see some notifications popping up over here on the right that it has successfully created it and it started detection or or checking of the disks, and now we have a storage pool configured. Now, a couple things. If you bought a six or eight bay NAS and you want to later expand into the other bays, say you bought a six bay and you only bought four hard drives to put into it, that's totally fine. You would go into the storage pool settings, manage the storage pool, and you would expand it to include those extra drives in the future. However, I know I said earlier in the video, I always recommend filling every bay from the get-go as rebuilding the RAID array can take quite a long time. But you can add drives in the future without formatting or erasing the data. Okay, so that's all done. I'm gonna go ahead and close the storage manager. And now let's move on to the next thing. Our next step is to set up the file serving settings on the NAS, and this is really simple. All we gotta do is go to control panel, file service, and we're gonna go to SMB, and we're gonna turn on enable SMB service. This is essentially just gonna tell the NAS to start acting like a file server. And the way that we can think about a file server in simple terms is a big external hard drive that happens to live on the network. Again, network enthusiasts, I'm sorry, I'm making simplifications. I know there's some terminology that I'm gonna use that's a little bit simplified, but uh, it's in the interest of everyone's understanding. So I'm gonna turn on enable SMB service. I'm not gonna change anything else. I'm gonna click the apply button, and that's going to turn this into a usable file server. Okay, now a couple more things that we need to write down. Down here at the bottom where it says how to use inside of the SMB settings. PC folks, you'll notice there's a little Windows Explorer access, enter address, backslash, backslash, forest NAS, or whatever your NAS name is. I would recommend you copy that and put it in your note with the password, the name of the NAS, all the useful stuff. Mac folks, same for you where it says Mac finder access and then the address copy that as well to your note. You are gonna use that address to access the NAS. Now, you can save it in your saved passwords, that's all great, but you'll need that number and you may need it in the future in order to access the NAS, so put that in your saved note. One final thing to write down is go to your control panel and go to device connection and make sure that you copy this custom domain name to your note as well. We may need that in the future for admin purposes in order to access the NAS through our browser. So let me reiterate, we wanna make sure that we have written down the NAS username and NAS password. We wanna make sure that we have written down the name of the NAS that we set up at the very first step. We wanna make sure that we have the local address, which is under file service SMB, and either the Mac or the Windows version or both of those addresses. And we also wanna make sure that under device connection, we have this URL written down as well. Lastly, I recommend bookmarking find.ugnas.com so we can access that in the future in case we lose the NAS on the network and we need to find out where it's living. All right, everybody, we have had a long video. Let's finally get into how we actually use the NAS on the network, the good stuff, what you've all been waiting for. I wanna just say this is a long video. We're going step by step. This is fairly quick stuff and you'll never have to do any of the stuff we just did again. The rest of this video is gonna be dedicated to the day-to-day -day use case, how we use this thing on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's go ahead and dive in and do it. I also wanna say, if you like this video, I'd really appreciate you hitting that like button. Hit subscribe down below to stay up to date with future NAS videos. I love NASs. I love photography. I love videography. So if you want to follow along with any of those things, hit subscribe down there. And like I've said before, put your questions down in the comments. Help one another. See if you can answer a question down there. I will be monitoring the questions as well. I'm happy to help out in any way I can. Okay, so I'm going to break our NAS access and use into two main buckets, day-to-day -day use and administrative use meaning setting up new features and bonus options on the NAS. Let's start with day-to-day -day use. If you're just trying to use the NAS as an external hard drive, what you're gonna do is a little different Mac to PC, but fairly simple. 
On a Mac, we're gonna make sure that we are in the Finder. So here I am in the Finder, and I'm gonna go to Go, Connect to Server. Inside of here, it's gonna ask us for an address, and this is the address that we actually wrote down in the previous step. It's gonna start with SMB colon slash slash, and then we're gonna type the name of the NAS. So I'm gonna go with Forests NAS. Now, Windows folks, you would open File Explorer, and in the address bar at the top, you're gonna to click up there and do backslash backslash name of the NAS. Again, what you copied in the previous step. I'm gonna click connect and it's gonna scan and we are gonna see it asking uh, for a username and password. Now this isn't your computer username and password, this is your NAS username and password. So hopefully you wrote this down in a previous step. My username is Forest C and my password is I'm not gonna tell you. So we'll type that in. And then you have the option to remember this in your keychain. Now Windows folks, you should have the same box pop up prompting you for a username and a password. I do recommend remembering it in your keychain or remembering saving the password. Just just know that you gotta have it written down too in case Windows or Mac forgets the password in the future. I'm gonna go ahead and click connect. And just like that, we are now connected to our NAS. Now Windows folks, you will see your NAS on the left-hand side of a Windows Explorer window. Mac folks, you will see your NAS on the left side of your Finder window. So here I am over here on the left, I can see Forest NAS. And in there I can see a folder called Forest C. And here is where all of my good information can go. So for all intents and purposes, from now on, this is a giant 11 terabyte or 12 terabyte external hard drive that I can use for anything. Uh, Mac folks, you may wanna go to Finder and Settings and turn on the show these items on the desktop for connected servers. That will put a little icon on the desktop for the NAS once you go go connect to server. Windows folks, you'll always see yours in this PC or over on the left sidebar in Windows Explorer. So that can be a nice way to quickly get to it. Again, if you don't see it, you just gotta go go connect to server and type in the SMB or the double backslash and then the name of the NAS. Mac folks, you can also hit the plus sign to save this to your favorite servers list. And then you can see I have some other servers in here that I commonly access. I can click the server that I want and connect and that will send me in. Now do note when you restart your computer, you'll have to connect to the NAS again, but no big deal. Now you all, here's the amazing part about this. Here I have my NAS that I've connected to by going go connect to server on a Windows machine, I've typed it in the address bar. And here I have a folder of images. This NAS acts exactly like any other external hard drive plugged into your computer or flash drive plugged into your computer. I can take a folder of information, here's some astrophotography, plunk it on the NAS and it will copy over to the NAS through the network can see it just completed. Now, how fast it copies? Well, that depends. Are you connecting to the network wirelessly through a wired gigabit or through a wired 10 gigabit connection? But the faster connection you're using, the faster your transfer to and from the NAS will be. If you have Lightroom photos that you wanna put on here, put them on here. If you have video files you wanna put on here, put them on here. It's a big external hard drive. So we can add files, remove files, we can do whatever we wanna do, and we have full control over this big bank of data that we have on the NAS. It's pretty amazing stuff. One note I do wanna make is those of you who use Lightroom Classic, unfortunately Lightroom catalogs can't live on the NAS. The photos can, the catalogs can't. So if you guys are interested, I'm happy to make a video on using Lightroom Classic with a NAS. It basically involves storing your catalog on your internal hard drive and the, NAS, the photos on your NAS. It works great, works fine, but there is a little bit of a hiccup there. Let me know in the comment section if that would interest those of you who use Lightroom Classic. So there we are everyone, we have a NAS configured, we know how to connect to it, we know how we know how the setup worked, and now we have a giant external hard drive and anything we put onto the NAS, as soon as it copies over, it is on a device that can handle a single disk failure. I wanna kinda of point out how cool that is. Those of you who are photographers or videographers and you've been using the main photo drive, backup photo drive for years, well, when you import photos to your main photo or video drive, if that drive fails, a single disk failure, you lose everything. This is different. As soon as something's on the NAS, you can handle a single disk failure and lose nothing. It's amazing. Now, again, it needs to be backed up somewhere else. Uh, I've made tons of videos on backing up, so check out one of those backup videos if you wanna learn more about this, but we want an off-site copy as well. And again, that'll be a future video topic. I promise sometime in the future I will, I will get into cloud backup 
markups and how we can do this. But the takeaway is we're already getting redundancy just by dragging something to the NAS. There's no button you have to click. As soon as something's done copying, it's on a device that can handle a single or double disk failure, depending on if you're in RAID 5 or RAID 6. The final thing I wanna show you is how you would access the NAS for configuration purposes. The easiest way that I can think of to do this is just to go to find.ugnas.com. That'll search your web browser, use your web browser to search the network, and you can click the connect button next to your NAS. This is gonna take you in, and we're gonna have all of our configuration options available. So this is if you wanna add more storage, you want to set up a cloud backup, maybe you want to use the NAS as a media server, there's all kinds of things NASes can do, and all of that is handled through the web browser. So web browser is great for that, you want to do remote access, awesome, but for day-to-day -day use, you're going to be using Finder or Windows Explorer, just like you would an external hard drive. All right, everyone, I hope you found this video useful. If you did, drop a like down below, I would really appreciate it. Leave a comment down in the comment section if you have any questions, and lastly, hit subscribe to stay up to date with future videos. I also have links in the description to lots of useful video material that covers background information, as well as a button to actually get this NAS and buy it. If you don't have one yet, I know this is a setup guide, but if you don't have one yet, uh, really high quality, well-built device. I'm really liking it so far, and you can buy one down below in the description. So thanks everybody, and I hope to catch you in the next one.